question. If you could ask Jesus one question, man, hard to beat that one. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus responds to this in kind of two parts. You'll notice that first he responds to that title, good teacher, right? And then he kind of gets more into the, the actual question itself. But he starts by, by addressing this first thing. He goes, why do you call me good? No one's good except for God alone. And, you know, that's an interesting statement to ponder, right? No one is good. That's not to say that we're just completely evil, okay? I think that's important to acknowledge that just because we're not good doesn't mean that we're like 100% evil. In fact, when God made us, he made the world, right? In Genesis 1, he looked at his creation, he saw that it was good, but then when he made mankind, he looked at it and said it was very good, that God has made us in his image, and so you have an inherent goodness in you, no matter what, that there's a stamp of God, there's a stamp of the Almighty on you, and there's an inherent goodness in all of us. I think this is so important because the way evil that's going to affect the way you just see people generally. I think God would say we are inherently good. We're made with goodness in us. We have his image on us. He looks at us and says we're very good. Now, of course, what's the problem? The problem is we've all, sin- we've all sinned, right? We've stained that initial goodness we were given. As we see in, in, in passages like Romans, that's also important to acknowledge. We are made with goodness. I think we have to... That on a core level, that's going to affect us. If you believe that, I made in the image of God, there's goodness within. But we also have to acknowledge that none of us is truly good, that we've all fallen short. One of the most common ideas out there, kind of on the street, is that as long as you're a good person, you'll go to heaven. Right? Just try to be a good person. Don't be a jerk. Try to help people when you can. Right? You don't have to be religious. You don't have to do, just, just be a good person. You'll make it. The problem is, as Jesus says... No one's truly good. No one's truly good, right? We might think we're good compared to other people, but compared to God, yeah. right? None of us is good. All have fallen short. And so we, we might even agree with that statement. You go, sure, yeah, I believe that. If you're a good person, you go to heaven. The problem is that person doesn't exist. That also helps answer that question of what about the innocent person in the jungle who never hears the gospel? Is God going to condemn them? The problem is there is no innocent person. That person doesn't exist apart from Jesus, right? right? Apart from Jesus. Jesus is the only truly good person. That's part of what he's doing here is he's kind of hinting at his divinity. He says, why do you call me good? No one's good except God. And he's not saying I'm not good. He's saying no one's good except God. You just called me good. So connect the dots. Down to the real question, right? You know, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And what we see here is that Jesus doesn't answer the question right away. What he's actually going to do here is he's going to kind of drill down a little bit into the real issue in this guy's life. It's a little bit like the story of the woman at the well. Do you remember that story in John 4, the woman at the well? Right, what we see there happen, you remember Jesus goes to off, he says, you know, offers her living water. And what does she say? She goes, great, give me this water so I don't have to keep coming here to this dumb well to draw water, right? Give me the water. And so Jesus goes, okay, sure. But first, I want you to go call your husband. And if you're reading that for the first time, right, you kind of go, your husband, what what does that have to do with anything? What do you mean my husband? What does he have to do with anything? And it seems kind of random, but she says, well, you know, Jesus, I don't have a husband. And he goes, you're right. You've had five husbands. And the man that you're with right now is not your husband. Right? And so through that conversation, Jesus is kind of drilling down into the real issue. We see in that, in that story of Jesus doing this through con- He's doing the same thing with this guy. And so he goes, okay, you want to know how to get eternal life? Well, you know the commandments, right? You know, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder. That's not the answer to the question. He's not saying, oh, just do all the commandments, just follow all these things perfectly and you'll be saved. That's not what he's saying. This is actually leading somewhere. Again, he's drilling down to the real issue. So he says, you, you know the commandments, right? And the ruler goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've kept all those since I was a boy. Now, that's an interesting claim. Oh, you've been perfect. We'll come back to that in a minute. But Jesus says, okay, well, you still lack one thing. And I love him actually in Mark's version. In Mark's version, he says he, looks at, he looked at him and loved him. 
And then he says, you still lack one thing. Like, Jesus isn't saying this like, well, you still lack one thing. He's like, man, I want you to get this. You still lack one thing. And what does he tell him? He says, I want you to sell everything you have. Give it all away. Trade your treasure on earth for treasure in heaven. And then I want you to come follow me. That's the answer to the question. How do I get eternal life? Follow Jesus. That's how you get eternal life. You have to follow Jesus. That's the answer to the question. But you can't do that if you're trying to follow something else at the same time. And that's what he's getting at here. What Jesus is trying to do with this man is help him see that he's got something standing in the way of following Jesus, of, of eternal life. There's probably a couple things standing in the way. A couple things. Probably one is he's got some religious pride. Right? He says this, this, this statement, all these I've kept since I was a boy. And in fact, if you look at the early rabbinical teachings, some of the rabbinical teachings uh, seem to indicate that they thought you could keep the law perfectly. And so that was a thing. That you, you, they thought, yeah, you can really, you can do it. You can keep the law perfectly. And he seems to think, yeah. And in fact, if you notice, what, what does Jesus quote? He quotes a few of the commandments, right? He says, you know, you shall not commit a ten. He's implying all ten commandments. And if you, again, if you know the, uh, the passage, what's the first commandment? First commandment is you shall have no other gods before me. Has he kept that one? Doesn't seem like it. What's his God? It's his wealth, right? He's got this wealth he doesn't want to part with. Seems like he's got another God. And that's the second thing. I think the first thing is he's got this religious pride that's a little bit blinding him. But I think he's also got this idol of his wealth. Why can't he follow Jesus? Well, he's worshiping something else. He needs to cut ties with his idol if he's going to follow Jesus. So that begs the question, what is an idol? I love, uh, Timothy Keller has a great book on this called Counterfeit Gods. And Tim Keller has incredible material. If you ever need a good podcast or something, his stuff is just super insightful. But he says this, an idol is anything more important to you than God. Anything that absorbs your heart in imagination more than God. Anything you, seek to, anything you seek to give you, only God can give. Anything that is so central and essential to your life that should you lose it, your life would feel hardly worth living. So that could be a lot of things, right? That could literally be anything. When we take, and even good stuff, when we take good things but make it the thing. He goes on, and he has another statement here that I thought was really good. He says, whatever controls us is our Lord. The person who seeks power is controlled by power. The person who seeks acceptance is controlled by the people he or she wants to please. We do not control ourselves. We are controlled by the Lord of our lives, right? And so everybody has a Lord. And either it's God or it's something else. There's something that's controlling your life. And if it's not Jesus... It's something else. So an idol can be anything. It can be good things like family, success in school. Right? Even commitment to the church can be an idol. If, if, if your sense of identity and satisfaction comes from being at events and how important you are in this group, like even a commitment to the church can be an idol. Right? These are all good things. But when we take something good and make it ultimate, when we say, I must have this, I cannot part with this, when our happiness and our meaning right, and our identity is more influenced by that thing than by God, we have an idol. I'll share for me. You know, when I, this is a little pathetic, but when I was in uh, middle school, I would pray. I was, you know, I'd, I'd pray. And uh, I prayed every night that God would give me a girlfriend. Every night. Dee Dee's like, come on. <laughs> it, was, it was a little sad. But I, I don't know if, if it was just my own stubbornness or God answered it. Eventually, it, 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 it happened one, one way or another. And it was totally unhealthy because it wasn't founded in in God at all. But I was like worshiping. I was like, I just want to find that person. I want to feel that, that I want to feel that, that sense of, of intimacy and feel wanted. And, you know, I think these days I, I've still got stuff that really fights for my heart. If I'm not feeling particularly close to God, if I'm struggling to find joy and meaning in him, it's really easy to start let, up, let other things start to fill that void. 
right? When I'm, you ever been there where you're kind of like, I'm a little distant from God, right? And you kind of start leaning on other stuff to kind of, to kind of feel that, that, that satisfaction that you're not getting from God right now. For me, there's a temptation in those times to let my hobbies turn into idols, that, to find more joy in fly fishing or in mountain biking than in Jesus. I think for me, people's acceptance can be a big idol, where I'm happy so long as you all like me, right? Now, don't take that and... and don't take that the wrong way. Please challenge me because I need to get over this, okay? So, um, but that can become an idol for me if I'm not careful. I think for some people, control. Control can be a big idol, right? It's, and it's one that comes out in a lot of ways. There's a lot of ways this one gets expressed. Like some people are obsessed with money, not necessarily just for the money's sake, but because it's a way to feel in control. Like if I have enough in my account, I can, I, I, my future is protected. My kids are protected, right? Like money is, is, it's kind of the surface idol, but the deep idol of the heart is control. And it comes out in a variety of ways. Family can be an idol. When we put family before God, right? When we feel like, okay, my kids must succeed at all costs. And so, you know, if we have to miss church week after week so they can go to their sports or whatever, then so be it, right? Like we can, we can let family become an idol. Anything can be an idol. The problem is, as Jesus said a couple chapters earlier, we skipped this, but he says, look, no one can serve two masters. You'll either hate one or love the other or despise one. You know, he, he says, no one can serve two masters. You can't follow Jesus when you're trying to follow something else or someone else at the same time. And what happens with this guy? Well, I mean, we see in the, in the passage... Back in the passage, it says that he walked away. Um, and not, in, and not in Luke's version. Luke just says he became very sad. But in Matthew and Mark's versions, it says that he walked away. He didn't do it. He didn't part with his wealth. He couldn't bring himself to tear down the idol in his life. I think some questions we need to consider. These are hard questions. But worth thinking about. What is the ultimate source of happiness, meaning, an identity in your life. And if everything of this world was taken from you, could you still be happy with God alone? Not that that wouldn't hurt, right? Not that, that, would, not that you'd be like, yay, everything's gone. But, but you would have to, you'd have to process. You'd probably be mad at God. But could you arrive at a place of God's enough for me? This is a tough one. I, I'm, I'm not saying that I'm in this place all the time. I've got to wrestle with this. I've got to wrestle with this. Because I think what happens is we either have an idol in our life or we have things that are contending to become idols in our lives. So I've got to keep a check on my own heart. I know that. I wanted to share uh, some lyrics from a song. Uh, there's this band called Beautiful Eulogy, and they're, they're kind of a Christian spoken word kind of rap group. And I'll play it for you, and then I'll read you a few of the, the lyrics. But... Um, Consider what they have to say. pretty powerful right if in one unfortunate moment you took everything that I own if the cost of my allegiance is prison and all my freedoms are lost if you take the breath from my lungs and make an end of my life if you take the most precious part of me take my kids my wife it would crush me it would break me it would suffocate and cause heartache I would taste the bitter dark providence 
but you would still preserve my faith. What's concealed in the heart of having is revealed in the losing of things. And I can't even begin to imagine the sting that kind of pain brings. I came into this world with nothing, and when I die, it'll be the same. I will praise your name in the giving and taking away. If I have you, I could lose everything and still consider it gain. That's, guys, that's the kind of hope that we have. I know that that can almost sound depressing, but that's the kind of hope we have as Christians. Right? That not that loss is easy. Not at all. Like, we need to process our pain. We need to process our losses. But at the end of the day, we can lose everything in this world and know if we've got God, we've got it all. We have an amazing amount of hope because we have everything we need in Christ. That's what Christmas is about. That's That's what Christmas is all about. He's given us Jesus. We have everything we need. Let's continue on with the, with the story here. In Luke 18, you guys doing okay? Yeah. It says, when he, when he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Why is it hard for the rich to enter the kingdom? Well, I think the rich, which, by the way, is most of us, we tend to put our trust in other things, right? The poor, the lowly, the outcast, they know what it is to be dependent. They know what it is to be desperate. They know that God needs to provide. They have very little, and therefore the cords binding them to this world are pretty thin. The rich have this, we have this illusion of control, right, of security. And so the cords binding us to this world are much stronger and thicker, and it's harder to cut those ties. It's much harder to trust in Jesus alone. It's not that we don't trust in Jesus. I think most of us, we're sitting here because we go, yeah, I trust in Jesus, right? But often it's Jesus and something else. It's Jesus and our idols, and this is what was happening even in Israel after the exile. They, uh, the Babylonians sent people, or the Assyrians sent people back to kind of resettle the land. And, and we see that, that this is the culture. It says they worshiped the Lord, but they also appointed all sorts of their own people to officiate for them as priests in the shrines of the high places. They worshiped the Lord, but they also served their own gods in accordance with the customs of the nations from which they had been brought. And I think we can do the same thing. Where we go, yeah, yeah, I'm serving Jesus. We like Jesus. Or, yeah, all, all, all in for Jesus. But we like to have our control as well. We like to have our comfort as well. We like to have our little pet sin that we don't want to get rid of as well. Name your idol. We like to have our thing on the side. And so the story continues. It says, those who heard this asked, who then can be saved? Jesus replied, what is impossible with man is possible with God. You see, the common thought of the day was if you were rich, it was because you had God's favor. You were blessed. God must favor you, and so therefore he's blessed you with these riches. And so when Jesus' disciples hear this and they go, you know, this rich guy can't, you know, the person who has God's favor, it's not necessarily true, but that was what they thought. This person who has God's favor, man, what hope is there for us, right? What hope is there for us? Who then can be saved? And so Jesus responds, look, what's impossible with man is possible with God. Yes, it may be hard for the rich to enter the kingdom, but nothing is impossible with God. We could do a whole sermon on that statement, couldn't we? Right, that that statement is generally true, I think. But let's evaluate it, at least for now, in context of this discussion, which is about following Jesus or the things that maybe stop us from following Jesus. So the question becomes, how can God help us to tear down the idols and to enter the kingdom? Right, for the people pleaser, for the conflict avoider, how do you finally break free from the idol of human acceptance? For the person who's addicted to sexual sin, How do you finally tear down the idol that you keep going back to, even though you vowed over and over never to return? For the person who strives to always be in control, how do you loosen your grip and place your life or your family members' lives or your friends' lives into the hands of God? How do we do this? 
These are nuanced issues. I don't want to oversimplify any of this, but I think it needs to be stated that step one, if you really want to change something you haven't been able to change, step one is believing that change is possible. Yeah. That what Jesus says, what is impossible with man is possible with God. It is possible to change. If you have some recurring character issue, some recurring sin, something that's unhealthy in your life, something that's against the scriptures, something where you're ready to give up because you go, what's the point anyway? I've been trying all this time. What you need to hear afresh tonight is what is impossible with man is possible with God. Now, I love that phrase, with God. It's not about doing it on our own, just gritting our teeth and, I've got to be better. It's, it's with God. It's not about just praying and, let, and, making, and, say, and just saying, God, change me. It's with God. It's a partnership. And so uh, there's this great book called With uh, by Sky Jathani. He points out that Christianity is not actually about living for God. It's about living with God. Yeah. We're not just these like, you know, slaves just kind of you know, serving, oh, I hope God, you know, favors me, but, but it's, it's a partnership. Christianity is this joy because we get to walk with God yeah. in relationship with him. And so the question becomes, how do we partner with God to tear down the idols in our lives? Okay, so this, this could be a whole other sermon. I'm going to go through this really quick and then we'll end. Tearing down idols, I think, first thing we've got to do, we've got to identify what they are, Right? I think idols can be hard to identify when we're used to having them around. You ever, like, put a note for yourself somewhere, like on your fridge, or you write something on your mirror or something, I don't know, and then it just stays there? Like, at first it was kind of like, oh, yeah, I need to do that. And then it became such a normal part that you're like, hey, I forgot about it, right? Or you have a sticky note on your lap, I don't know. Those things that become permanent after a while, you just, you just stop even acknowledging them. They're just, you're just so used to it. That can happen with idols in our lives. It's hard to identify. It's hard to see them sometimes. And what I want to say is don't assume that you're just idol free. Some of us in here have already tuned me out because you go, ah, it's not me. The truth is we, we all have either some idols in our lives or we've got something that's trying to become an idol in our lives. Yep. And so we need to keep a check on those things in our hearts. So step one is we've got to identify, ask God. Say, God, could you please reveal to me what's, what's in contention as an idol, you know, or what, what I'm idolizing right now. Be honest with yourself. Be open to how God may speak. He might speak through his word. He might speak through a friend. But work on identifying. Be honest with yourself. Second thing we've got to do is we've got to go to God. And I'm not going to read uh, all this right now. We, don't, we still don't have time. But there's some amazing, cool stories in the Old Testament where people, like, get some conviction and they tear down some idols. One of them is in Judges 6. You've got the story of Gideon. I don't know if you know this story, but... Um, the angel comes and visits Gideon, and Gideon has this personal encounter, this conversation with the angel of God, and, and uh, basically gets called to, to rise up and save the nation. But step one, before he became this great leader, step one was, he's like, I want you to tear down your father's idol. Like, you know that one in your backyard you've grown up with? I want you to tear that down. He's like, oh, I don't know. You know, and so he's kind of scared, so he does it at night, and he brings some friends with him, but he does do it. He cuts down the idol, he, he uses the... And he builds an altar to God, and he uses the idol to, to actually be the firewood for the sacrifice on God's altar. God's like, yeah, take that idol. You know, he's like just painting the picture of I'm the one in control here. But Gideon, man, what a cool story. Write that down. Judges 6. You can go study that later. But such a cool case study on what it takes to tear down an idol. I think what we need is you need, like him, to have an encounter with God. You need to have time with God where you get the conviction. You go, I'm scared. I don't know what this is going to mean for me. I don't know if I can do it. But, but, but God's called me to do it. Amen. And I'm going I'm to do what God's calling me to do. 2 Kings 23 is another really cool one. It's a story of King Josiah. This is where much later on, the Israelites had neglected the law of God for years. And what happened is they're going through the temple and they're clearing it out. You know, they're doing some spring cleaning. And they find the scriptures. They're like, hey, what's this book? And they, they read it and like, oh my goodness, this is God. This is the Bible. This is like God's laws. They're like, where was this the whole time? And so they read it and they go, oh my goodness, we haven't been following any of this. And so King Josiah just gets moved. He's like, we have to do something. God is upset. Like we need to obey what this has been saying. We clearly haven't. And so his heart is moved and they start just destroying all these idols that had built up over the years. They just clear out the land. I'm going to read just a couple verses from that. If you want to turn there, um, 2 Kings 23. I'm just going to read a couple verses. We're not going to do the whole thing. But this is just too cool of a story to skip over. 
You guys hanging in there? Yeah. Second yeah. Kings 23, I'll just start in verse 1. It says, uh, Then the king called together all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. He went up to the temple of the Lord with the people of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the prophets, all the people from the least to the greatest. He read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which had been found in the temple of the Lord. The king stood by the pillar and renewed the covenant in the presence of the Lord to follow the Lord and keep his commands, statutes, and decrees with all his heart and with all his soul, thus confirming the words of the covenant written in this book. Then all the people pledged themselves to the covenant, right? So that's step one. They're like, they get conviction from the word. They're like, okay, we're going to follow God with all our heart, whatever that means, whatever that takes, whatever the cost, we're going to follow God. We want to follow God. And so then what happens is the overflow of that decision. Verse 4, the king ordered Helkiah the high priest, the priests next in rank, and the doorkeepers to remove from the temple of the Lord all the articles made for Baal and Asherah, right? Those are false gods. These are idols. Remove all that stuff and all, all the stuff to the starry host. He burned them outside the Jerusalem in the fields of the Kidron Valley and took the ashes to Bethel. They didn't just throw them in the trash because then you could go and get it again later. They're like, we're burning them. You know, so they, they throw it in the thing. They, they throw it in the, in the valley. They burn the idols. All right, they, they do away with the idolatrous priests, all this stuff. And if you go down, it just goes on and on. They're, they're cleaning out this. They're cleaning out that. They're tearing down this altar. There were so many idols that they needed, and they had neglected to, to, to follow for so long. There was so much to do. But they tear down all these idols. And finally, in verse 25, you just jump down to verse 25. It says, Neither before nor after Josiah was there a king like him who turned to the Lord as he did with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his strength, in accordance with the law of Moses. We'll stop there. So again, you see, it started with a conviction from God's word. They read the word, and he goes, we need to, I want to follow God. And his heart gets moved, and he goes, I'm going to follow God with all my heart and all my soul. And that led to change. I think change happens when we encounter God in his word and turn to him with all our heart, soul, and strength. I think if we're honest with ourselves, a lot of times things haven't changed because we haven't given it all our heart, soul, and strength. Maybe we've given it some, and then we go, see, it didn't work. Come on, God. And we, or, we, or we pray, and we go, God, come on, why aren't you changing me? And we're not really partnering with God, right? But, but it's this idea that, man, we need to turn to him with all our heart, soul, and strength. And I think number three is we've got to trust God. We gotta trust God because, right, you can't surrender unless you have trust. Yeah. Sky Jathani in his, in his book, he has this great quote. He says, Surrender is only possible if we have total assurance that we are safe. We must be convinced that if we let go, we will be caught. This assurance only comes when we trust that our Heavenly Father desires to be with us and will not let us fall. You see that? Like it, it, these things that we're holding on to, these things that we, we struggle to surrender. He says, you can let go if you trust that someone's going to catch you. you can, if you trust that God will provide what you need. So we've got to trust God. We've got to identify, turn to God, trust God. I'll end it here. Here's how the conversation ends. Peter said to him, we have left all we had to follow you. Peter's like, well, what about us? You know, we, 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 we're following you, right? Jesus, come on. And Jesus goes, yeah, yeah, you know, you can, you, can, you can rest assured, Peter. Truly, I tell you, Jesus said to them, no one who has left home, or wife, or brothers, or sisters, or parents, or children, for the sake of the kingdom of God, will fail to receive many times as much in this age and the age to come eternal life. The, the core of that message is Jesus goes, I'm going to take care of you. Whatever you've been hoping to get from your idols, from this world, I'll provide it in an even greater way. It's worth it. It's worth it. And so to close out, as Paul says in Romans 8, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? When God gave us Jesus, he gave the very best he had to give. And if God has given us his most treasured possession, why would he hold back anything else? 
Christmas, Christmas reminds us that God has gifted us his son. And so we can let go of the things of this world. We can let go of our control. We can let go of our striving for satisfaction. We can let go of whatever idols we're clinging to. Because we know that he who did not spare his own son will, along with him, graciously give us all things. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.